If you didn't know, sleepwalking is a crazy thing. You don't think about it too much if it doesn't affect you or you've never seen anyone do it, but it's very real and can be really scary. I'd sleepwalked a couple of times in my life, but always ended up waking up and getting back in bed. It was something I experienced more when I was younger. So when I was looking for a roommate and found a guy, Brandon, that seemed like a great candidate, I wasn't too worried when he told me he would occasionally sleepwalk. Brandon moved in in August of 2012 and only a month in, the night terrors began. Something he had completely forgotten to mention before. I'd wake up around 3 or 4 in the morning to the sound of him screaming, and not screaming like he saw a spider or something, but screaming like someone was in his room trying to murder him. Whenever I went to check on him, by the time I reached his bedroom he was fast asleep and quiet as a mouse. This continued for months. He'd scream, I'd wake up and he'd be completely asleep by the time that I went to check and make sure that everything was okay. Eventually I stopped checking on him because every time I did, he was fine. I decided to try and talk to him about it because the more than anything I just wanted to see him see a sleep specialist or something to try to get this sorted out. Most mornings when I saw him, he'd barely be able to walk from all the screaming that he'd done the night before. But every time I mentioned it, he said that he didn't know what I was talking about and that he'd never had a problem with screaming in his sleep. He believed me, but also wasn't willing to see anyone regarding the issue because he thought it was so surreal and he was just too busy. I was frustrated by that a little because not only was the screaming completely unnerving, but at the same time, I was losing so much sleep over it and he woke me up constantly. By month five, the actual sleepwalking started. It began with me occasionally hearing his bedroom door open and him walk around the house. The floorboards would creak underneath him and the few times I went to make sure that he was okay or see what was going on, it was obvious he wasn't awake. He told me not to wake him up if I were to ever find him in the state, so I didn't. I let him walk around for hours sometimes before he would make his way back to bed or sometimes even fall asleep right there on the floor. I felt bad for a while. But it was what he told me to do and I was going to respect his wishes and I heard it could be a bad thing to wake people up while sleepwalking. A few weeks after getting used to him walking around the house at night, I was shocked to wake up to him opening the door to my room. I couldn't see him, but also didn't bother asking who it was or what he was doing because I was sure that he was asleep. I turned the flashlight on from my phone and saw Brandon standing at the corner of my room facing the wall. Now he did tell me that sleepwalking might actually happen, and if he did make his way into my room to just guide him back to his room and lock the door behind me, so I just did that. From then on he'd occasionally make his way into my room and I always put him back where he wanted to go. It was irritating for a while but I guess I just got used to it, like taking care of a kid or something. Brandon was a genuinely nice guy and I had no other reason to kick him out so I put up with these weird sleep habits for a while. He even started bringing me things in his sleep, always something random like my toothbrush from the bathroom or a screwdriver or something equally meaningless. He would leave the items at the foot of my bed and I would wake up to him standing there above me and the items, almost like he was waiting for a reaction. But that couldn't have been the case, he was asleep. His sleepwalking stopped bothering me altogether when I realized if I left him alone, he'd find his way back to his room eventually. It even stopped waking me up when he came into my room. I had learned to sleep through it, and I knew that he was still coming in though because I would wake up to my door open when it was closed the night before or I'd see the things that he left behind after a long night of him walking around the house. It went from being weird and slightly creepy to just kind of normal to me. He still apologized all the time for it, but I didn't mind. Brandon was a better roommate than anyone else I'd be able to find. The only thing strange about Brandon was the fact that he had no friends and from what I could tell, really no family either. It was always just him. He'd go to work, come home, eat, and then go to sleep. He had a routine and he always stuck to it. I found it odd, but I didn't think too much of it. That was until what I found one morning on the foot of my bed. It was a picture of me sleeping. It was clearly taken on a Polaroid camera and it started making me sweat just looking at it. I showed Brandon that morning and he started to apologize. He told me he probably took it while he was sleepwalking and we joked about him being a sleep photographer and I got over the whole thing pretty quickly and just chalked it up to another weird thing. Well, I told him I got over it, but that day I went out and bought a new doorknob with a lock for my room. 
I didn't want him coming in unannounced anymore and that seemed like a good solution. He even told me that was a good idea so he wouldn't wake me up anymore. And I guess he didn't realize I stopped waking up from him coming into my room and I installed it that night and there was a sense of relief when I went to sleep with a locked door for the first time since living with Brandon. That night I woke up to the sounds of Brandon's body slamming into my door over and over, almost like he wasn't registering that it wasn't opening this time. I got up from my bed and opened the door to lead him back to his room, but instead he pushed his way past me and into the room. I tried turning him around but he was set on where he wanted to go. He got on his hands and knees and reached under my bed and pulled out a small wooden box. I stood beside him as he set it on my bed and opened it up revealing its contents. Inside were more pictures of me sleeping, I don't know how many, and next to the pictures was a six inch long knife. I had never noticed those things under there before but I guess I just never thought to check under my bed as I really didn't use it for anything other than just random things ending up there. He grabbed the knife and stood over the spot in my bed I'd usually be sleeping and just started stabbing the mattress in my pillow. I immediately came to, freaking out, screaming for him to stop, and thank God he woke up. He just looked at me, then at the knife, and what he'd done to my bed in one swift movement exited my room without saying a thing. I stood there in shock for a while, wondering what in God's name had just happened, or if this was going to happen again. I looked at my destroyed bed and I just was speechless. I locked my door at that moment as it was close to sunrise and I just waited it out. I couldn't sleep again. In my haze, I eventually went to work the next day and came home to his room empty and all of his things were gone. I wanted to make a formal complaint with the police but I never did as I tried to get a hold of him but there was no one I knew who knew him either and he didn't answer his phone. I never heard from him after that and refrained from getting a new roommate until about a year after that happened. I suppose it's the best that he left. I was planning on kicking him out after that, but it was like he just up and disappeared. He'd obviously planned on killing me and whatever subconscious thought process he had going on while sleepwalking, but he just didn't know it. It was like the person he was when he was sleepwalking was a different person than who he was when he was awake. I just never knew it was possible to actually murder someone in your sleep. I don't do much writing when it comes to stories about my own personal life, so bear with me as I take you on this weird, scary, and absolutely awful experience that was my life for two months in 2015. The best place to get started is by giving a little background. My two friends and I decided we wanted to rent a house in LA since we all got jobs in the area and had dreamt of living together after we all got out of college. We got a pretty decent price for rent that was split between all of us, but also thought that if we had one more person as a roommate, the rent would be perfect. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house so we had the space and my friend Molly said she knew someone who needed a place anyways so it would be perfect. We all met her and got along great in the short amount of time we spent with her, so we all agreed it would be a good fit between the four of us. Our new roommate's name was Dove, and for the first month that she lived with us, she was amazing. She did her share of the housework, and honestly, for the most part, she stayed pretty much to herself. She never had people over and never complained and was generally one of the sweetest girls I'd ever met. We all used to talk about how lucky we were to find a roommate as great as Dove. That was until she met the man that become her boyfriend, Ty. The first time she brought Ty over to the house, the three of us were shocked. He was covered in tattoos, including his face, and he reeked of marijuana and just had the worst attitude of anyone we'd all collectively had ever met. Dove, on the other hand, either seemed not to notice or didn't really care. She took him into her room and thankfully we didn't see either of them for the rest of the night. The next morning we woke up to our TV, vintage stereo system, and our freaking microwave completely gone. Obviously, Ty had done this since he was the only person in the house besides the four of us girls, and we were livid. We banged on Dove's door until she came out and confronted her about it. Instead of denying it like we expected, she told us that she'd actually just given him the stuff. He said he needed it, and she just told him to take it. 
She didn't see the problem and got mad at us for yelling at her for allowing him to just steal our things. She said she'd replace what was taken, but that was never really the point. We decided to forgive her, but told her if she was going to continue living with us, she couldn't have Ty over again since he was clearly terrible. She didn't like that, but agreed. A week went by and nothing of significance happened. Then one random Tuesday night when the three of us were watching a movie while Dove was out, we heard the door open and to our shock, in walked Dove holding the hand of Ty. She walked right by us like we told her the week before meant nothing to her and slammed the door when they got into her room. We decided on spending the night in the living room to possibly prevent him from taking anything else, but not even that worked. On his way out, Dove told him he could take whatever he wanted from the fridge. He grabbed a grocery bag and practically acted like he was shopping as he took most of what was in there as we yelled at Dove that he was not allowed to take our stuff again. They ignored us like we weren't even there. Neither of them would even look in our direction. Ty just walked out of the door, and we stared as Dove made her way back to her bedroom saying nothing as we asked her to explain what was going on with her lately. It didn't take long for us to realize Ty had gotten her hooked on pills and was just her hookup. It's why she never said no to him. To her, it seemed like getting what she wanted was all that really mattered. We watched for months as she deteriorated in front of her eyes, and the three of us had to move everything into our bedrooms to make sure it wouldn't get stolen in the night and installed locks on all of our doors since Dove and Ty constantly had random druggies come over to our house. No matter what we did or how much we begged, Dove refused to see things logically or from our point of view. So we did what any sane person would do in a situation like this. We waited for Ty and his friends to come over, and we promptly called the police. They told us to leave the house before they got there, and we went to our neighbor's house and watched out the window as an actual SWAT team arrived and raided the place. Ty and a couple of his friends were arrested for multiple different things involving drug possession and sales, which we did mention, but we never expected this kind of reaction from the police. Dove was let go since Ty took the blame for everything. We were relieved. We thought maybe this would mean that Dove could finally kick this habit, get some help, and just be done with that monster. They did end up searching the whole house, including our bedrooms, and the place was a disaster by the time we were allowed back in. Dove was irate. She screamed at us and told us that we ruined her life. We tried telling her that she needed to get help but she refused and said that she'd be moving out as soon as possible since we had apparently betrayed her. We felt bad for her in the situation that she was in, but we were all kind of relieved too. Now, a couple of weeks after Ty's arrest, we were all hanging out in the living room not expecting what was about to happen. All of a sudden, the door burst open, and in came four guys wearing blue and black ski masks. They ran over to us as we were screaming and grabbed the three of us as one went into Dove's room and pulled her out as she was kicking and screaming. They dragged us outside, put us in a van that was waiting outside with the driver as the rest of them piled into a car behind us. I was positive the neighbors had heard what was happening and all I could do was hope that one of them had called the police. Once we were in the van, one of the men took our phones and told us all to be quiet. He drove for at least an hour with no words spoken until the van pulled over. They opened the door and threw us out. We were standing in the middle of a dirt field as they tied our hands behind our backs. Dove seemed the calmest as we all were beginning to beg for our lives. They told us we shouldn't have ratted out Ty and that we'd be paying for it with our lives. We all started to cry and beg and plead, but Dove, she seemed like she was laughing and she started cracking up and calling us babies for crying. She told the guys to untie her hands and that it was a funny joke, but that she was over it and just let us go. Instead of doing what she said, one of the guys just decked her really hard in the face and told her to shut up, and she hit the ground hard and then started crying herself. I actually believed then and there that I was going to die. These men were going to murder us and that would be it. I was just hoping that they'd find my family so my family could maybe get some closure from my death. And those were the thoughts that I was thinking. Begging wasn't doing anything. We watched in horror as the men who had taken us began digging these large holes just in front of us, and I was sure that that's where we would be buried. Just as I had started to come to terms with the fact that my life would be ending that night, in the distance I could see flashing lights speeding towards us, and I burst into tears. 
we were saved. The men tried to run, but it was a big dirt field and there was nowhere for them to go. The police officers got over to us, untied our hands, and thankfully they were able to apprehend all four men and we were escorted to the hospital. We didn't have any serious injuries so we were let go that night. We all eventually went to my mom's house just outside of LA and waited to hear from the police about what was being done to ensure these men stayed in jail. They were all charged with kidnapping and assault as well as conspiracy to murder. All four of them ratted on each other as well as Ty and their sentence ranged from, and I kid you not, 17 to 25 years and we were glad this meant none would have the chance to finish what they started anytime soon. I guess that night was a wake-up call for Dove, as she was also arrested and tried for being an accomplice. All of my roommates have kept in contact, except obviously Dove, but we agreed we didn't want to live in that house after that happened. I still live with my mom. Molly and our friend Jenna live together in a small apartment in LA, and we all get together from time to time for lunch. I have PTSD from that night and still get nightmares about it. I'm just glad I have my parents to help me get through it. And I urge anyone to be there for their friends if they notice red flags alluding to drug abuse. Even if they say they aren't ready to quit, sometimes just knowing there is a person that cares means more than you'll ever know. I probably should have taken my mom's advice when I started looking for a roommate, but hindsight is always 2020, right? I was 22 years old when this story that I'm about to tell you took place, so bear with me when you hear the absolute idiotic decisions I made during that time in my life. There is a huge detail anyone reading this story needs to know before it started. It's something I never planned on sharing, but thankfully nothing bad can come from it now. I've had a stalker since I was around 15. I never met him in person or knew the person that was making my life miserable, so my family did everything they could to keep me safe. It started at the end of my freshman year of high school. I started getting secret admirer notes left in my locker for me to find every morning when I opened it up to get my books. It was always stuff about how pretty I was and how amazing I looked the previous day. Innocent enough that I didn't think to tell my parents at first because it was probably just some guy in one of my classes with what I assumed to be a harmless crush. I was wrong though. Not about the person having a crush, but that maybe it was harmless. It actually was anything but. I got a car when I turned 16. Nothing crazy, just my mom's old minivan. I was so excited to finally be able to drive myself to school every morning. I never thought that that was information I'd have to keep to myself, so I didn't. I told everyone that would listen about how cool it was to have my car and how having a minivan was actually pretty fun, lots of space and so on. It must have reached the wrong person at some point because the cute innocent notes turned into gifts left on the hood of my car. I didn't trust them. I'd seen a bunch of videos on how kidnappers will leave stuff on your car so they can grab you while you're distracted and trying to grab it. So instead of picking them up off my car like anyone else would have, I had whatever guy friend I could find come and take it and dump it in the trash for me. It happened a few times before I got a note in my locker telling me the gifts were from them and that they were safe to open. The next day, there was another gift on top of my car. I had a friend come out with me and this time I decided to open it. Inside was something so incredibly creepy and inappropriate, I just had to tell my parents. Contained in the box was a scrapbook. The front read, our future life together. Inside was all these crudely photoshopped images of married couples, with my picture over one of the couple's faces in each of the photos. The last half of the scrapbook was just my face photoshopped onto a naked woman's bodies with messages along the side that said stuff like, can't wait to see you in this lingerie and I bet this is what your body looks like. I started crying then and there in the parking lot out of pure disgust and terror. Why was this person doing this? I rushed home and showed my parents the scrapbook and whatever notes I still had that had been left in my locker the months before. They called the police and a detective came over to take my story. The next couple of years were spent in constant fear. The stalker would find any way they could to leave notes or gifts. We had to install cameras that recorded all around our house since the person kept coming back. Multiple times throughout the night we'd get alerts of movement outside the front door but all we could catch was a person wearing all black leaving the creepy items behind 
never enough to suspect anyone. Flash forward to 2018 when I was 22. It had been at least two years since the last time I had heard anything from my stalker. It calmed down a lot when I moved away from university. I was a 20-hour drive from my hometown and instead of letters and gifts, I got Instagram DMs and emails. And those were things I could handle. Things that didn't scare me as much because now all I had to do was block them. Until one day, it just stopped. The relief was incredible, but the paranoia still remained. There was nothing anyone could do or say to make me stop looking over my shoulder. Nothing anyone could do to make me fully trust someone again. That part of life had been ruined for me, taken from me. Even though I was scared, I thought it might finally be time for me to move on, get on with my life. Up until that point, I'd never had a roommate, never lived with anyone other than my parents and siblings. I was ready, I thought. I'd done everything right. I went through the university to find a roommate, even made a Google application so people could apply online and I could do a sort of background check on them. It might sound crazy, but I really tried. Most men I passed on, some even had the audacity to ask for pictures to make sure that I'd be attractive enough for them. It was disgusting, really. And that's when I started only taking applications from other women. I met with a few, but we didn't seem to click. That was until I met Ashley. She was funny and smart and very motivated, and we had almost everything in common, and I couldn't find anything negative about her online, and I just felt that it was a perfect fit. She moved in the next month, and everything was great for a while. We became very close, did practically everything together. I didn't realize at the time that a lot of that was mostly because Ashley never really let me go anywhere without her. Not that she was forcing me to stay home, but she also always had a reason to tag along. Her clinginess only got worse when I started dating my boyfriend, Matt. Now, Matt was a really, really good guy, the perfect gentleman. So imagine my shock when Ashley never really liked him. She would say really out of the blue stuff, like I should break up with him and that he wasn't good enough for me, and then seemingly joke and say, no one's good enough for you, well, except for maybe me, of course. Then she'd laugh, and it just felt really off-putting. But after the tenth time of her saying that, I started to realize that it wasn't a joke at all. She didn't want me to be with anyone else because she wanted me to be with her. I tried distancing myself from Ashley and spending more time with Matt, and she became more withdrawn and spent a lot of time in her bedroom. About five months into Matt and my relationship, I woke up to the sound of my door creaking open. The light from the hall shined directly into my face, blocking me from seeing the person entering my room. I called out to her name. Ashley? Ashley, is that you? Come on, this isn't funny. Say something. The room was dark now that the door was closed and I couldn't see anything. I reached toward my nightstand to grab my phone when I felt a hand close around my wrist. I grabbed my phone and harshly pulled my hand away. I turned on the flashlight and wasn't surprised to see Ashley. Of course it was her. What surprised me was the fact that she didn't have any clothes on and was holding a doll with a picture of my face stapled to it. It was truly surreal and I wondered if I was in some sort of nightmare. She was smiling this smile right at me and she said nothing and just cradled this doll in her arms. I started to scream at her to stop, to get out of my room, but she wouldn't. She just stood there, staring. I got out of my bed and rushed out of the room as quickly as I could. I stood in the hallway outside the door to our apartment and called Matt. He lived only five minutes away, so I knew that he'd be there soon. I watched from the hallways as Ashley paced back and forth in the apartment. She'd begun humming to the doll. I recognized the song as the same one my mom used to sing to me before I went to sleep. She sang it to me all the way up until I left for school, but it had to be a coincidence, I thought. Matt arrived and was just as shocked and weirded out as I was. He was glad I called him but admitted that there was nothing he could do. The only option we had was to call the police and have them take her to a mental hospital or something if they found that she was at risk. We thought maybe that she had gone out and was just high on a large amount of LSD or something. Now when the police arrived they asked her if she knew her name and why she wasn't wearing any clothes. They tried covering her with a blanket but she threw it off every chance she got. She kept saying her name was something other than the one she'd originally given me and when they asked her where she was from, I was confused when she said 
the name of my hometown. She told the police that she was going to hurt herself if she couldn't have me, and that was enough for them to take her to get placed on a psychiatric hold. Once she was gone, Matt and I decided it was a good idea to go into her room to see if we could find anything else about her being a different person than the one that she led us to believe. What we found was eye-opening and gave me the closure I desperately needed. Inside her closet was what I can only describe as a shrine to me. There were pictures of me sleeping, eating, and walking around town. But the pictures that made me understand why she did what she did were the ones from high school. Ones of me. Someone I was only 15. She even had a few of me standing next to my mom's minivan opening the sketchbook my stalker had made me. And that's when it hit me. My stalker wasn't some guy from one of my classes or even a guy at all. It had been Ashley, a woman, the whole time. That was something I never expected. We called the police again and they took pictures of the shrine before taking it down and bagging it as evidence. Now I want to make it clear nothing Ashley did was violent or threatening in any way. Now in saying this there was no way she was going to get jail time and I actually didn't really think that she should. Instead I got a restraining order against her. She's not allowed within a certain distance of me and no contact whatsoever and I was happy about that. It had been three years and I hadn't heard from her since. Her mother did reach out to tell me that she was on medication and not to worry about her anymore. I never did get to ask why she was as obsessed with me as she was. I still get curious sometimes, but never curious enough to try to figure it out. All I really learned from her mom at the time was that she was from my high school, but just one of those faces I never really paid any mind. Her mom even told me that she was under the interpretation that we were close friends back then. I just can't believe she went through all that trouble to move states just to be closer to me, and it's hard to imagine I invited my own stalker into my home to live with me. Make sure your roommate is someone you can trust, someone you know, because when you have someone in your house, the place you eat, sleep, and expect to be safe, you need to know that they wouldn't do anything to harm you. I made the mistake of trusting a total stranger and inviting her into my home to live with me. I put an ad on the bulletin board at the grocery store where I work and one of my co-workers, who I didn't really know at all, called and told me that she needed a place and that she'd love to rent the other room in my apartment. The other girls I worked with all said that she was cool and that she'd be a great roommate, so I agreed. She moved in and I immediately noticed that she was one of the most socially awkward people I'd ever met. She could barely look me in the eyes and whenever I entered a common room she was also in, she'd leave and go back into her bedroom. I didn't know if I was doing something to make her uncomfortable but I also couldn't really find out because she wouldn't talk to me. I tried my best to make her feel like it was as much her home as it was mine but there was nothing I could really do to get on her good side and have us be friends. I asked my coworker if they told the truth about her being cool and fun and they said that they were being completely honest when they vouched for her, that they didn't know why she was acting the way she was with me. She'd never given off any red flags to them before. She was living with me for a few months before I felt comfortable enough to have my boyfriend come over. I wanted her to feel settled first out of respect but her attitude never changed and I was tired of waiting. I told her the day before that he was coming over and she said it was fine. The next night came and after going to dinner, my boyfriend and I came back to my apartment to watch a movie. We sat on the sofa and turned on a random movie, when halfway through we heard her door open and she came out, completely nude. I yelled at her to go back into her room and she giggled and said she didn't notice. She went back into her room and came back out in a robe and she sat right between my boyfriend and I, basically squeezing herself into the small space separating my leg and his and asked what we were watching. She dragged her fingers across my boyfriend's leg while she waited for an answer. He was obviously uncomfortable and got up quickly. I immediately told her what she was doing was gross and inappropriate but she just rolled her eyes at me. The next few times he came over she acted the same way. She shamelessly flirted with him, trying to seduce him or something. It was really bizarre. No matter how much she told her how disgusting she was acting, she never seemed to let up. A few weeks later, she started acting differently towards him. Not flirting, but still overly nice. She'd make him full meals and 
once in a while make me something too. Her occasional offers of making me meals became nightly and I began to get used to her doing all the cooking. I guess I appreciated it, especially after long days at work and I never turned them down. After a while of living together, I got sick, really sick. I woke up nauseous all the time and could barely hold myself up most days. I thought maybe it was the flu at first, but after a few weeks, I knew something was seriously wrong. My boyfriend took me to the doctor multiple times, but nothing ever came of it. They never could figure out what was wrong, and I had allergy tests done, blood tests, and even a brain scan done, and there was seemingly nothing physically wrong with me. I went weeks where I didn't feel right. My roommate started acting weirdly nice towards me during this time, taking care of me, bringing me soup and medicine. I was so grateful for her. I felt like we were finally connecting. We'd watch movies, listen to music, and it was great, and I felt like we were starting to finally get close to each other, which made what she did to me even harder to process. After months of my symptoms getting worse and finding no solution, I started to feel like I was never going to get better. Then one morning, when I decided to get up earlier than usual, I went into the kitchen and saw my roommate making me something to eat, something she'd done most mornings voluntarily. She was putting everything onto a cute tray like she does when she brings me breakfast in bed, and I watched her for a second, about to say something, when I saw her grab a bottle from under the sink. She unscrewed the cap and poured some of whatever it was into my smoothie. I ran back into my room before she saw me standing there and laid back in bed to make it look like I was still asleep. She came in and set my food in front of me, but I told her I was too nauseous to eat. She complained and tried to get me to eat, but I refused as politely as possible so she wouldn't get suspicious. She left for work an hour later and I went into the kitchen to see what it was she was putting in my food. I pulled out the bottle and was horrified when the label read, Antifreeze. I realized it was her who had been poisoning me this entire time, making me feel the way I did. I didn't want to believe it, but it really seemed like she was trying to kill me. I immediately rushed to the hospital with my boyfriend and got a blood test that came back positive for high levels of ethylene glycol. Apparently ethylene glycol is exceptionally hard to detect in a blood test unless it's been specifically instructed to look for that compound, which explains the past blood tests coming up as nothing being wrong with me. The doctors were amazed that I was still alive after having been ingesting these toxins for weeks. I should have been dead. We reported this immediately and she was arrested that evening and surprisingly admitted to everything. The detective said that she was so calm and acted as though what she did was totally normal. She said that she wanted to be with my boyfriend and saw getting rid of me as the only way to have him. She was actually going to murder me to have a guy. Psychotic, right? And she was sentenced to seven years in prison for attempted murder. It wasn't relief that I felt when I watched her get sentenced, but a sense of closure. I felt like I was going crazy when I was sick and no doctor could tell me what was wrong. All I can say to everyone out there thinking of letting a stranger be your roommate, if you don't fully trust someone, don't ingest anything they give you. Disgusted and repulsed don't even begin to describe what I felt toward my ex-roommate. She was really something else. Moving into the dorms your freshman year of college is supposed to be one of those fun experiences in life, something you look forward to all summer. Well, I look forward to it at least. Move-in day went well. I was a little disappointed when they told me that I wouldn't be having a roommate. I always envisioned my roommate becoming my best friend and doing everything together, but I guess that wasn't meant to be. The first half of the school year went great. I made plenty of friends and had gotten really used to having the room all to myself. When they told me I'd be getting a roommate in January, I was actually pretty bummed. I cleaned up the other half of the room to accommodate the girl that would be moving in and just hoped that we would get along. She came the second week of January when we had gotten back from winter break. She told me her name was Cassandra, but they should just call her Cassie. And Cassie didn't have much. She said it was because her parents never bought her anything and whatever she had, she had bought herself. I think she had maybe four boxes in total. I felt bad for her and told her that she could borrow some of my stuff if she ever needed to, but to ask first so I wouldn't think that I just lost it or something. And I quickly realized Cassie wasn't the average 18-year-old girl. She was different. First, she had horrible hygiene. 
I had to beg her a few times to take a shower in the nicest way possible because she would smell so bad that I actually would gag when I entered the room. She always thought it was kind of funny. She never washed her clothes, which also meant that the clothes that she would borrow of mine never got washed either. She would give me back my shirts with sweat stains and food covering the front. It was like this girl had never been taught any manners or basic social skills ever in her life. But the worst thing about Cassie was her obsession with eating raw meat. And I'm not kidding you. I walked in on her eating cuts of raw bacon one day, and she tried hiding it when I walked in, but there was no way that I could unsee that. I asked her why she was eating raw bacon, not to shame her or anything, but I just was genuinely morbidly curious, really grossed out obviously, but still curious. She said it was something that she'd always done growing up and that her parents ate raw meat too and that it was just a normal thing for her. I honestly thought it was completely disgusting, but I also was trying to be a good roommate and as nice as I could, so I told her as long as I didn't have to witness her eating it in front of me, I was cool with her keeping her raw meat in the mini fridge. I should never have said that. The next day I opened the mini fridge to find it full of pounds of pounds of meat. All different kinds too. Bacon, ground beef, different cuts of steak, and even some goat meat. When Cassie walked in and saw me staring into the fridge, she looked at me. She was smiling ear to ear, so proud of her meat stash. She bragged about the deals that she found, and before I could stop her, she reached in front of me, grabbed a package of ground beef, opened it up, and started shoving it into her mouth. I almost threw up right then. I was yelling at her to stop, and with meat still in her mouth, she just laughed. I reacted in horror when I felt bits of it land near me, and that only made her laugh harder. The next day I requested a room change. I couldn't take it, but I was told that that would only be possible in the next two weeks. I was fine with that as long as it meant that I could escape the nightmare that was this disgusting person known as Cassie. She really freaked me out. I told her she wasn't allowed to borrow my stuff anymore since she never returned anything in a good enough state for me to use anyways. She was upset, but seemed to understand. We didn't talk much the week after I requested a room change. She continued to stash all her meat in the fridge, but at least she wasn't eating it in front of me anymore. A couple of days before I was due to move out of the room, I was sitting at my desk next to Cassie when she walked out of the room. I got a call from one of my friends and leaned back as we talked. I was looking around the room when my eyes settled on her computer. One of the tabs had three words that read, Wanted fresh meat. I laughed and told my friend what I saw. He told me to click on it and see what it was because he was curious, and I never in my wildest dreams would have expected to see what was on there. When I clicked on the tab, my laughing quickly halted. My friend was asking me over and over what it was, but I was too scared to even speak. It was an ad that she had posted on a website I had never even heard of, and the fresh meat that she was looking for wasn't from a cow or a pig or a goat. She had posted a wanted ad for fresh human meat. In the ad she carefully explained how she liked eating raw meat and had always dreamed about what human meat would taste like. She seemed to be obsessed with it. One line completely caught me off guard and made me want to join the witness protection program immediately and in it she said, eating human flesh has consumed my every thought. Sometimes I watch my roommate sleeping and fantasize about chewing on her. I took a picture of the ad on my phone and clicked off of it so she wouldn't notice I was on her computer. I grabbed my bag and headed out, telling my friend to meet me at the police station immediately. I told them everything and showed them the picture of the ad. In conjunction with the university and their concern, they spoke to Cassie about this, and surprisingly she admitted to everything. They took it as far as actually testing all the meat in the fridge since we lived on campus, but thankfully. It was all either beef or pork. I was able to get a restraining order against her and she was expelled from the university for apparently accessing the dark web while using the school's Wi-Fi and for attempting to engage in illegal activities. Now for a while, people actually compared Cassie to that German guy, Armin Maiwis, who cannibalized a person who volunteered to be eaten. Who knows if she really would have gone through with it though. I don't think Cassie was ever charged for what she did. I tried to distance myself from her as much as possible. Hearing her name five years later would still be too soon. After her arrest, I just never saw her again. 
I think she must have just moved away out of embarrassment for what she did, but she was expelled from the school, and the entire town knew who she was and what she did. There would have been no escaping the whispers and dirty looks, and I do hope that she got the help she clearly needed. I still don't know how anyone could survive eating raw meat like the way she did. I ended up getting a new roommate after that who was perfectly normal, maybe even a little boring in some ways, but that was totally okay with me. I'll take boring over a cannibal any day. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I hate dogs. Please don't be mad at me when I tell you that. I'm not some psycho who thinks dogs don't have souls or they're evil, I actually used to love dogs. I was so excited when I moved in with my buddy who had four of them so you could imagine I was a little disappointed when he told me not to interact with them. He said that they were only tame around him and his girlfriend and if anyone else came near them they'd quote unquote freak out. It was a little scary to think about four very large dogs who hated me living only a wall away but my friend was usually pretty good about locking his door when he left or putting them out in the backyard if he was going to be gone longer than a day or so. One summer, my roommate said he and his girlfriend were going to visit his family a couple of states away and that he'd be leaving the dogs in the backyard for a few nights. He had automatic feeders and the dogs had access to this weird pedo activated watering system so there was no need for me to go out and give them anything. The backyard was pretty huge and he assured me that they'd be fine and out of my way all weekend. I felt safe knowing that they'd be out of the house. No one was able to control those dogs except my roommate, so keeping them away from all the people while he was gone was definitely the right move. The day came where my roommate and his girlfriend left. I woke up and went downstairs for some coffee and looked out the sliding glass door at the four dogs as they stood there staring at me. Now these were all huge German shepherds, so seeing them growl at me but not being able to do anything about it kind of made me laugh a little bit. I went through my regular morning routine and got ready for work. I left the rest of the day and came home around 6pm after going to the gym. As I entered the kitchen I noticed something was very wrong. There was glass all over the kitchen floor and the sliding glass door was shattered. And that's when I started to hear the growling coming from behind me. I didn't even have to turn around to figure out what the sound was coming from. I did what any smart person would do and ran as fast as I could up the stairs into my room. The whole time I was running it felt like that dog was going to latch onto my leg at any moment. I slammed the door shut behind me and grabbed at my pocket to get my phone out and call 911. Except it wasn't there. The pocket was empty. I wanted to cry when I realized that I'd left my phone in my car and my gym bag. I felt so stupid. And you're probably wondering why I didn't just call for help outside the window. Well, I would have if we didn't live a mile from the next house. My roommate insisted on living in the country so his dogs could have a big yard to run around. I was really regretting moving in as I sat there wondering what the hell I was going to do to get myself out of that situation. I didn't even know where the other dogs were. I had only seen one when I made my way upstairs and I guess I could have overlooked them in the panic. Maybe the others were chasing me too. I leaned against the door and sat there for a few seconds before bang. Something huge and heavy was smashing itself against the door. Growling came soon after and I quickly realized the dogs were actually trying to get into my room. I didn't know if they were rabid or something, but I couldn't just sit there and wait for them to get to me. With the progress they were making on the door, I knew that they'd get to me at some point. The banging didn't last long before the scratching started. It was even louder than the banging and would quickly grant them access into the room if they continued to tear at that door. It was clearly very flimsy. I ran into the connecting bathroom and closed the door behind me. Listening to them scratch and gnaw their way through my door was mental torture. Getting ripped apart by dogs was not the way I wanted to leave this world. There isn't a single moment in my life where I wished I had access to a landline until that moment just then. I heard the door finally giving way and the dogs finally entered my room as they growled and barked. It was the kind of growl where even without seeing it you could tell that their teeth were showing. I still couldn't tell how many dogs were out there, I just knew that it was more than one. I tried my hardest not to move or make a sound, but the sweat on my hands made a squeaking sound when they slid across the floor as I tried to get up. My heart dropped and I knew I was screwed. 
They started their assault on my bathroom door and I had no choice but to get into my bathroom counter and climb through the very small rectangular window about three feet above the sink. I squeezed myself through and laid on the roof out of sight of the dogs in case they got into the bathroom as well. Hours went by before they got in. I felt safe though and this was the moment I realized that I had an injury on my left calf. The adrenaline must have worn off because the pain was getting worse by the second. I pulled up the leg of my pants and revealed a pretty severe bite along the back of my leg, and I kept wondering how long I didn't notice when that happened, but there was no changing anything then. Thankfully, the bleeding had mostly stopped, but I still wrapped it up with the flannel that I was wearing. I didn't need it exposed to whatever was on that roof. It was obviously the only choice I had was to wait on the roof for my roommate to get home a couple of days from then. I couldn't jump down because the dogs would get me. If I did jump down, I wouldn't be able to drive away because my car keys were downstairs in the house and I wasn't going to risk going inside again. I was safe on the roof and that was all that mattered. I didn't have food but thankfully there was a spigot only a few feet from where I was sitting. It was a considerably large house and the spigot was installed to easily hose off the roof if needed. I never knew what that was necessary for, but I of course was grateful to have access to water for the next couple of days that I guess I would be spending on that roof. The hunger wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The worst part was hearing the dogs make their way through the house at night looking for me, and thank God they never found me though. My friend came back Monday morning and was shocked to find me on the roof. He gathered his dogs in his bedroom and helped me back into the house. When he found out what happened, he begged me not to tell the police or animal control, but I had no choice. One of his dogs had bitten me and they were so vicious that if they ever got out, I had no doubt that they probably would kill somebody. I went to the hospital and was treated for the bite wound and I was advised to get the rabies shot treatments and wasn't too happy about that, but it was smart so I went along with it. The dogs were impounded and after evaluation it was ruled that they would be humanely euthanized. My roommate blamed me for having his dogs killed, but I can't say I regret their outcome. I feel like lives may have been saved by them being euthanized. I try not to blame the dogs since I've known so many amazing shepherds in my life, but I do have this trauma. It turns out the sliding glass door had been broken in by a tree, pushed down by the strong winds earlier in the day after I'd left for work. Most large dogs scare me now, and I can say that I don't particularly like dogs in general anymore because of this incident. It's disappointing, but oh well. I got my two cats and that's perfect for me for the time being. Hopefully one day I can find the love for dogs I once had. I think the real moral of the story is to not move in with a guy who is open about having aggressive dogs. What I'm about to tell you happened a little over a year ago, so it's still all pretty fresh in my mind. I was 18 and a girl in my class named Kendra was having a really hard time at home. Her parents fought all the time and she always talked about how much she wished she could just disappear. She confided in my mom, who was a teacher at the high school we went to, and my mom offered to let her stay with us. Only we didn't have an extra bedroom so that meant that she'd be staying with me as a roommate. I was really upset. My mom moved most of my furniture out to make room for another bed. Kendra was 18 too, which meant that she didn't have to get permission from her parents to leave, so she moved in pretty quickly. I noticed right away that something was off with her. She would spend hours sitting in front of the mirror, just smiling at herself. I would ask her what she was doing, and she always responded that she was practicing. Only, she wouldn't say for what. Most nights, I'd hear her in the bathroom talking to herself seriously having full-on conversations, and it really freaked me out. But when I told my mom, she just said Kendra was awkward and having a tough time and for me to be nice. Kendra and I never became close. She made it very clear that she didn't like me. She ignored me constantly and would express anger whenever I'd hang out with my mom without her. Her jealousy turned into something really weird the day she dyed her hair to look like mine. She even went to the same hairdresser I go to and gave her a picture of me to go off of. She was open about it too. I continued to complain to my mom about her, now copying the way that I look, but again she told me to just be nice and put up with it because Kendra was having a very hard life. Weeks went by and the copying got worse. She would repeat everything I said, but in different voices. 
almost like she was trying to mimic the way I sounded. She started using my clothes too, and no matter how much I told my mom it creeped me out, she always told me to just go along with it for a while. I started feeling uncomfortable in my own home. I hated being in my room with her. The worst nights were when I would wake up to Kendra standing at the foot of my bed. Sometimes she'd be staring at me. She'd smirk when I expressed a sense of fear. And after a few months of her living with us, I decided to start sleeping in the living room to try to escape the awkwardness of sharing a room with a person I had started to believe was a legitimate sociopath. The living room proved to be not too much better though. She would still watch me sleep from the armchair across from the sofa and laugh when I woke up, scared of what she might do to me in my sleep. My mom never believed me when I told her what she was doing during the night. She told me Kendra always denied it and that I was probably making the whole thing up to try to get her kicked out of the house. I was done at this point. I decided one night that I was going to set up a camera to catch her in the act so I could show my mom and Kendra would be gone for good. That night, I set my phone on record and positioned it so it would hopefully be out of sight. I never expected to see what I saw the next morning when I went to check what I'd caught from the night before. I watched as Kendra slowly and quietly made her way down the stairs towards the sofa I was fast asleep on. She stood at the end of the sofa for a whole 30 minutes before she sat down in the armchair to watch me for another hour. Then she made her way into the kitchen. With wide eyes, I watched as she came back into the room with a large knife. She walked towards me and bent down to whisper something in my ear, and she laughed and held up the knife above her head like she was going to stab me with it. Then she brought it down quickly, but stopped just away from my face. I screamed when I saw her head turn to look directly into the camera. I wanted to cry when I heard her say, You actually thought I didn't know what that was there? I know everything that happens in this house. Remember that. She then walked toward the phone and turned the video off. I immediately rushed upstairs to tell my mom, but instead was struck in the chest with a wooden baseball bat. It was Kendra. I screamed at her and asked her what she was doing while trying to catch my breath, but she looked at me with no emotion on her face at all. She started to drag me into my room, and as I was in that daze from getting struck, she began to tie me to the desk chair. She told me I didn't deserve the life I had. I shouldn't have been given a loving family when she was given an awful one. The goosebumps that went through my body confirmed what I was thinking when she said, You don't appreciate the life you've been given, so I'm taking it. I started shaking uncontrollably, begging her to let me live. She laughed and told me that she wasn't going to kill me. She was just going to live as me for a while. I didn't really know how that was possible, but I decided... It was best not to antagonize the crazy person right in front of me. And I was already pretty sure that she'd broken a few of my ribs with a bat and I didn't want her to pick it up again and continue where she left off. She dragged me, still tied to the chair, and put me in the closet and closed the door. I could still see her through the cracks and cringed when she put on more of my clothes and styled her hair to match mine. Finally, I could hear the sound of the door opening and my mother coming home from work. She called out my name and... I started screaming for her to help me. Kendra opened the closet door and told me to be quiet or she'd hurt my mom, so I shut my mouth. I watched as my mom burst into the room and asked her where I was since she'd heard me calling for help. I started to feel sick when Kendra said, But mommy, it is me. My mom looked at her with pure confusion and asked her what she meant, and Kendra kept repeating herself, It's me. Don't you recognize your daughter? I saw my mom's face drain of color when she asked Kendra what she'd done to me, and that's when Kendra had enough. She shoved my mother to the ground and screamed in her face that she was her daughter and she needed to act like it. My mom got up slowly and as nicely as she could, she says, Oh, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what's got into me today. Of course you're my daughter. Let's make, a, let's make some tea. Stay right there. She left the room and... Kendra opened the closet door to tell me her plan was working and that my mom believed her. I, of course, knew that clearly wasn't the case and that Kendra had lost her mind. I was 100% positive my mother was downstairs calling the police, but I wasn't going to tell Kendra that, though. My mom came back upstairs 15 minutes later and told Kendra that T was downstairs and to please join her. Kendra and my mom left the room and within seconds, 
I heard the police entering and her being arrested. My mom found me in the closet soon after and untied me. She immediately apologized for never believing me and in that moment, I was just happy to be in my mother's arms. Kendra was charged with assault with a deadly weapon at first but was deemed unfit to stand trial. Instead, she was sent to a mental facility where they'd assess her condition further to decide whether or not she should be a danger to herself or others. She was sentenced to spend at least three years in that facility before she'd have the chance to get out. All in all, the experience was truly a nightmare, but I also couldn't help but feeling at least a little sorry for Kendra. She was never given a chance in her life to grow into anything but what she became. She may have been the scariest roommate I'd truly ever had, but I don't blame her. I blame her horrible parents. If they had just given her the life she deserved, I doubt that wherever her mental health started to deteriorate, it may have never actually gone down that route. A couple months in her stay in that facility, I got a letter from Kendra in the mail. In it, she told me that she was on medication and had plenty of time to think about what she did. She apologized and expressed how much she hoped I could forgive her. I actually wrote her back telling her I had already forgiven her and that I hope she continues to get the help that she needs and that there was no hard feelings between us. And even though I have forgiven her, I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't still a part of me that's scared of what she might do when she does eventually get out. Having a roommate was never something I planned on, but knew was inevitable. My parents were never wealthy enough to promise they'd pay for my housing once I moved out, so I kind of always knew that I would have to have a roommate at some point. That point came when I moved into an apartment a little outside of my price range closer to the university I was going to. I had lived in the dorms the first couple of years I was in college and decided this year that I was done being disgusted by the communal bathrooms and a guy living in the same space as me, and I figured at least this way I'd have my own room and bathroom. My parents offered to help me find a roommate since they had friends with children going to the same university as me, but I just wanted to get it over with, so I did what any other idiot would do. I posted an ad on Craigslist, basically saying I was looking for a roommate who picked up after themselves and didn't have multiple people over too often. I thought that wasn't asking too much. I really was fine with a guy or a woman, so I never specified that, although I was a little shocked when a girl actually did respond to my ad. She told me that she was moving out of her parents' place and even said that she'd do all the cooking and cleaning if I would take $100 a month off of her half of the rent. I thought that was awesome, so I agreed to meet up to get a feel of the kind of person she was. We met at a local coffee place and she told me how excited she was to move in with me. She showed me pictures of her room and her parents to prove that she was clean. I found it a little strange considering I never asked for pictures. That would never have even crossed my mind. I got a little uncomfortable at one point because multiple times throughout her conversation she just kept repeating how clean she was, but she seemed nice enough so I agreed to let her move in the next day. She practically leapt into my arms when I told her my decision. The next day came and she was at the apartment at 7am sharp. I helped her move all of her stuff into her room which was pretty easy considering that she literally only had a bed, nightstand and one dresser. No personal items. It seemed a little suspicious to me but... I'm not the kind of person to ask a bunch of questions, so I left it alone and let her get settled in. After around an hour, she came out of her room and started cleaning up around the apartment while I watched TV in the living room. After she was done, she walked right in front of the TV and just stood there with her arms crossed like she was waiting for me to acknowledge her even though she'd never said anything to me. I look up at her and asked her what was up and was shocked when she basically ordered me to go to my room because she was having company over and it would be better for her if I just stayed in my room the rest of the night. And that's the moment I started to question whether or not I made the right decision letting her move in. I guess I just reluctantly agreed, not wanting to get into an argument, but I planned on speaking to her the next day about how she needed to give me more notice when she'd be having people over. I got in my room and locked the door and just decided to work on some homework until whoever it was she was having over left. I guess I probably should have mentioned to her that the apartment has really thin walls. I don't think she knew that I'd be able to hear everything that went on that night. And God, I wish I didn't. It was incredibly disturbing to say the least. There was a knock on the door and I listened as she walked through the apartment to answer it. 
She opened the door and greeted the man by saying, Hey daddy, ready for a wild night? I was horrified. Not because of what she said, but because of what I knew I'd be hearing for the rest of the night. And heard exactly what you think I heard. It was loud and what was said was literally gross at times. It finally stopped at around 2am when I heard her walk the guy to the door. I exited my room to finally get the glass of water I had very desperately needed for the last few hours and almost dropped to my knees in disgust when I smelled something putrid coming from her room. I started gagging and forced myself away from her door and into the kitchen. I got the glass of water and basically sprinted past her door to avoid the stench. I was amazed that she was still in there with whatever that smell was coming from. I woke up the next morning fully expecting the smell to have gone away, but it was still there. And not only did it fill the hallway, but the rest of the apartment as well. I pinched my nose shut and knocked on her door, but she didn't answer. I figured that she had gone out and prepared myself as I turned the doorknob and opened her door. I refrained from gasping as I saw the room absolutely covered in human feces. I'm not kidding. It was everywhere. On the walls, on the floor, on her bed. Smeared everywhere. I couldn't help it. I started to throw up as I ran out of the apartment. I called her and told her she needed to pay for a cleaning crew and that she needed to move out by the end of the day. She was calm as she told me that yes, she'd hire a cleaning crew, but she'd not be moving out. She told me I would have to get her evicted and that would take at least 30 days. Then she said something that gave me chills. So because you've decided we can't work this out, I'm going to make the next 30 days of your life in this apartment a living hell. Then without another word, she just hung up. The days after the conversation, she'd bring back men over to the apartment constantly. A few of them stole some of my stuff. Basically anything that was worth anything to me had to be kept inside my room or would never be seen again. She'd make these huge meals in the kitchen and not clean up after herself. She left used feminine hygiene products sitting around the apartment, seemingly to gross me out. I'm not ashamed to admit that there were a few nights I cried myself to sleep over what was going on. I ended up going to the landlord to tell him all that was happening, but because each resident of the building was legally required a 24-hour notice before inspection, my roommate always had enough time to clean up the place by the time they came over to check it out. The worst one was one day, when I came home to around 50 bags of literal festering garbage sitting in my living room. I could smell it before I even opened the door to the apartment, but the wall of rotting garbage stench hit like a ton of bricks as I walked inside. It actually looked like she'd gone out in the street and collected all these just to torment me. I called the police that night and all they did was tell her that she needed to get the garbage out of the building since it was a health hazard. It took her about half a day but it was eventually taken care of. The last week she was there was by far the worst. And I know you may be thinking, how does it get any worse than that? Well, I'll tell you. The men she brought over stopped being confined to her room as she took it upon herself to have her fun in the living room. The stains and smell on the sofa were some I knew I was never going to be able to get out. She stopped using the bathroom actually in the bathroom and just did it on the floor instead. I am not kidding you. The gross part was that she acted like it was nothing. She'd walk around and laugh when I screamed at her to clean it up. And it just felt like when I was younger when my parents had a dog. It was really, really strange. She even got her quote-unquote devil-worshipping friend to put a curse on the whole apartment building. I don't know what that really meant, but... I just began to hate my life. I didn't move out because I had a lease I couldn't break, so the best I could do was wait it out. And finally, the day that she was meant to move out came. She moved her furniture out of the apartment and spat in my face on the way out as she laughed at the damage she'd done to my home. It took a full week of deep cleaning before things were finally back to what they used to be, and I remember the property management that would check in from time to time even asked me if I was secretly keeping a dog there. Once it was back to its original state, I didn't even want to think about getting another roommate. I got another job and decided that I'd rather work multiple jobs than have to possibly deal with a person as awful as she was living with me again. I was done, and thankfully I heard from a friend that she was actually arrested for meth, and in some odd way it just made sense to me. I never had any problems in my apartment after that, but still decided on moving after my lease was up. I moved back in with my parents and have been living with them ever since. I'm in graduate school now and still think about it as being the worst month of my life by a long shot. 
I felt like I was alone beyond the ability to be alone. It was like no one would hear me out. And all I can say is if you do need a roommate, choose someone who's not secretly addicted to meth. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.